Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, for those who don't know the project, um, I've got a pretty cool photo up here to just give it an overview of what it is. But essentially, it is an indoor roller coaster attached to the side of a mall. Um, the entire structure is about 60 meters tall, and there's a 700 meter long track inside. Now, because of the nature of the building, it's not a traditional structure. The entire building is a large atrium, except for a central core, which was for the MEP plant and the cooling. Um, so it was a very untraditional design approach and behavior of a, of a building because of the nature of the shape of it and, and what we had to do to put inside. So quick overview, um, the building's 60 meters tall and has a, a footprint of 45 and a half meters. Um, inside it, there's a 50 meter vertical LSM launch. That's a magnetic launch propulsion system for the roller coaster. Uh, so this is the first time this has ever been done in the world. And it was um, fortunate enough to break the world record for the fastest vertical moving coaster um, ever made. Um, as I mentioned, there's a 670 meter long track, um, and then it's a, a multi vehicle roller coaster. So there's three trains, uh, uh, three cars, um, and 12 people on, on each of these cars moving around um, inside there. Uh, there is just about 8,000 steel elements inside the building, um, nearly 3,500 cubic meters of concrete. Um, and that large atrium is nearly 73,000 cubic meters of, of open space. And then on the facade, there's 2,500 modular panels on it. Uh, a quick cross section to give you an idea of the building. Um, so the, there's a, the large um, circular open atrium. In the middle of it, as I mentioned before, is an MEP core. So this is purely used for the cooling of the space. So in, in the seven level, each space there is um, uh, HVAC units that are pushing air out into the building. Um, the track wraps, wraps around the outside of the building. And then as you can see on the left there, there's the station that connects in, into um, the mall. So for those of you that haven't seen the location of the building, um, it is located at Dubai Hills Mall. So this is with respect to Dubai. Um, and the mall is located on our Kale Road and Um Sakim. And as you can see the coaster there, is attached to the side of the mall. Um, so the plot was quite tight um, that we had to put this building into. And the mall was sort of very well progressed when the construction of this project started. So there's a lot of challenges on site to build such a complex geometric structure um, in, this, in this tight footprint. Um, a quick overview of the stakeholders involved in the project. So the client was EMI Entertainment. Um, but you can see there's two columns because the project, because it's attached to the side of the mall, it, it was, we, we had to work very, very closely with the stakeholders on, on the mall side as well. So we had two different clients, even though they're both under the umbrella of EMA. Um, obviously, Kundal, where I'm from, we were the lead design consultant. Um, and then some of the main people I just want to point out is Intamin, who's the ride specialist and the, the vendor of the ride. And then Alec, who's the main contractor. Um, so to go right back to the start, how did we end up with this project? Um, so EMA wanted a anchor tenant for the mall. So they wanted something similar to Ski Dubai where it's something a bit, bit different, a bit crazy, and people can do their regular shopping and golf and, and have some fun. Um, so they wanted an indoor roller coaster. Um, but one of the key aspects was it as it, they wanted it to be a multi-vehicle LSM launch coaster. So that's very, very different to what a typical indoor roller coaster is. Um, usually indoor roller coasters are a bit small, a bit aimed at kids, um, but they wanted something that was that you'd experience at a proper theme park. Um, and as I said, the challenge, the footprint of the site was less than two and a half thousand square meters. So they wanted this very fast, big roller coaster um, in a very, very small footprint, and then also be attached to the side of the mall. So Looking at typical indoor coasters, um, usually an indoor roller coaster is actually just an outdoor roller coaster with a roof over the top. And that's sort of what makes our project very, very different. So typically the track and the enclosing structure is separated um, and all the coaster loads go directly down to the foundation. And one of the other challenges that we face that most indoor roller coasters don't have is there's usually no more than two layers of track on a vertical plane. So essentially, when, when you look at it, you can see there's a track and another piece below it. But when we go vertically down, there's no more than two, which makes it very easy to support because it's easy to miss the track below. 
Um, and then also most indoor roller coasters are quite small with the limited track length. If we look at outdoor roller coasters, which is what Yuma wanted, the thrill level in outdoor roller coasters, they're very, very big. Um, so here's an example of a comparable roller coaster um, at Ferrari World, and it's about 200 meters by 185 meters in, in size. So they take a very, very large footprint and also they're exposed to the climate. And that was one of the key driving factors of what EMA wanted was they wanted a roller coaster that could be ridden every hour that the mall was open every day of the year, um, which, is, which is, especially in UAE climate, it's quite a challenging thing to do with an outdoor coaster. So a quick depiction is they wanted a proper outdoor roller coaster. They wanted it within a 50 meter footprint. So essentially we're rotating on its end. And they wanted it attached to the side of the mall and then they wanted it inside a glass tube. So that was our project brief to start, start off with. Um, so with all crazy roller coaster projects, you have to go to the right vendor. Um, and on this project, we use Interman, which is one of the best, if not the best roller coaster suppliers in the world. Um, so here's an example of three roller coasters that they've got in UAE already, and they, they, they're supplying roller coasters to every country around the world. Um, but Intamin are the type of company that are very, very innovative, up for a challenge and up for doing something that's never been done before. Um, so early on engagement, they were, they were approached and they started off by giving a track layout that would work for the brief. So this track layout, um, there was a couple of iterations, but that's the final one that, that we settled on. And as I said before, it's 670 meters of, of track. Um, and it has that 50 meter vertical launch, which is, is, is a world's first for a roller coaster. So what we had to do is we had to decide how do we actually support this track? So if we approach it from a traditional aspect, um, most coasters have vertical columns or A-frame columns that continue from the track directly to foundation. Um, and this was not an option for us because due to the size and due to the, the layers of track that we're facing, so there, there's four layers as we go up, um, it, was, it was not possible for us to support this coaster traditionally. Um, so the next option used for very high roller coasters is a tower structure. So this is a vertical steel structure that's dedicated just to support the track. Um, but looking at that, you can see that there's a lot of wasted material because we're having a steel structure that's supporting the track. And then also we're going to have to have a separate structure that's supporting the facade and, and roof of the building. Um, so the proposal that we came up with was, why don't we connect the roller coaster to the side of the building and then have to deal with all the challenges later that that brought with it. Um, so that was our starting point, and this is basically not where we were at the end of pre-concept moving into concept is we had a roller coaster that we wanted to support off the side of the building. Um, we knew the material had to be steel. Uh, the track's made of steel and it didn't make sense to use any other material due to the geometry and the, the integration of it. So we first looked at three options of how we can support this building. Um, a brace frame, a die grid, and then a moment frame. Um, early simulations showed that the moment frame wasn't stiff enough, it was too flexible, and the size of the joints were getting quite large and were unable to, to receive the tolerances and, and the movement requirements of the track. Um, the brace frame was an option that we looked into, and obviously it was a preferred option from a constructability point of view, because it's quite simple to do um, the connections of the brace frame. Um, but the issue was, is this is a, is a, a showpiece structure and the brace frame didn't have the, the architectural requirements um, that we we're looking for, as well as it actually ended up using more material than the chosen solution, which is the diagrid, because the diagrid were combining the vertical columns um, with the diagonal bracing into a single system. So the diagrid, um, which at the time was very popular because everyone was seeing Museum of the Future being built in Dubai, um, was the preferred solution. Uh, another advantage of the diagrid uh, was how we could support the track. Um, so the tracks supported off uh, a, a tripod system um, off the facade of the building. And by having a diagrid system, we had an equilateral triangle that we could connect our tripod into, which basically had very even angles between these members. If we're using a moment frame or brace frame, which was a, a, a square based um, frame solution, we actually had basic eccentricity in these tripods when it connected to these nodes. 
Um, so our early analysis showed the diagrid was the most appropriate solution. Um, so leading on, and hopefully this plays, um, this is a, this is, here we go. This is a, a video of, of one of the initial parametric uh, models that we implemented on the project. And essentially we'll playing around with the client, the coastal supplier and the architect with examining different diagrid solutions and options that we could implement onto the project. Um, so in the, the initial stages of the concept, we had this parametric model that could form different, different shapes of diagrids. Um, and then we could export them quite quickly into structural analysis software to see how they performed and how they lined up relative to the track that was being proposed um, because we needed to orientate this. Um, we played with some funky solutions on different shapes um, to, to have different architectural options um, for the coaster. However, however um, these weren't pursued mainly from a cost point of view because they're not modular, as well as it didn't make sense because we wanted the, we wanted the cylinder as close to the track as possible so that we, we didn't have to waste material with these tripods reaching out. Um, so there's just some shots of some funky um, buildings that were looked at really, really early in the pre-concept. However, as you see on the photo, the, the solution that was went was, was, a, was a perfect cylinder so that every single member was the same length and every single uh, facade element was the exact same size. So looking into the supporting system on, on how we supported this track, what we were faced with was a track that's wrapping around the side of this building and it moved anywhere from uh, three meters to 11 meters away from the facade of this building. And the other thing you can see in this image is the orientation is not the same because it's not a perfectly flat track. This track twists and turns on a three dimensional axis as it wraps around this building. Um, so early on, these were the options that we were looking at for how to support the track. So anything on that lower level um, in the inside of it was obviously going to use a very traditional ground support system um, that's normally used on roller coasters. We started to look at this tripod solution where we could have these three arms coming out from the track and connecting into the nodes of this diagrid. And then for some of the elements that were further in, we we're looking at a bridge solution where we would have these members spanning between the central core and the external skin of the diagrid. Um, after some analysis and discussion with the roller coaster vendor for the support of the track, I'll talk about it later, but the, the governing factor for the design of a roller coaster track is stiffness. And it's differential displacement that, just, that, that governs how you decide, design it. So it's how much does one support move with respect to the other support. And what we found was using this MEP core in the center of the building, the bridge was much less stiff than the tripods around it. And on that section of the track, it was quite soft and it was moving vertically in a large amount with respect to the support before and the support after it. So that idea was scrapped quite early on in the process. And we realized that everything had to be connected to the diagrid because that was the only way to maintain the correct stiffness on this track. As you can see here in the cloud, another one of the challenges we faced um, was clashing with what's called the clearance envelope of, of with some of the supporting members. So if you've ever worked on a rail project, you'd understand what clearance envelopes are, but roller coasters have the same, same um, envelopes as well. And as you can see here, that's the example envelope that we have. And that is an envelope that's used for the hands of the occupants. So there cannot be anything inside that envelope. MEP, um, conduit, lighting, and most importantly, structural steel cannot be inside that. Um, that's a code requirement and obviously a safety requirement. So because our tracks wrapping and turning, as you can see in the bottom right and the top right, um, that clearance envelope is this twisting snake that goes throughout the building. And some of the supporting connections were quite a challenge to reach out to them to make sure that we had the, that we had the correct track support, but we we're also not clashing with this clearance envelope. Um, so you can see here, we actually had to result to some eccentrically connected tripods in order to get that pipe separation out and not, not be clashing in with the mem clashing in. So what, we also did in Grasshopper um, was we started to play around with the connections and the, the sizing of the diagrid and how these tripods support. So as you can see here, I'm manipulating different um, 
geometry of the tripod. I'm twisting it, I'm changing shapes. And the code is grabbing the points on the track and it's automatically drawing these tripods to connect into these diagrid nodes. And what the code was also doing was it was telling us if it clashed with that clearance envelope and I was identifying those locations um, so we could look into them and see what we could do to move them in order to um, mitigate and eliminate that clash. Um, this was done early on in the process and it was a, a thing to note is the design time for a roller coaster is quite long from the vendor. Um, so we weren't receiving the final design information until the end of schematic design. However, because cost was a big factor on this project, we had to get steel tonnage and cost BOQ estimates out quite early at the end of concept and early schematic design to see if it was, if it was feasible moving ahead. Um, so we were basically making assumptions for the loads of these roller coasters, making assumptions for these track positions ourselves in order to get these, these cost estimates out. Um, so as I said, what this parametric code did early on was allowed us to do a preliminary sizing of the die grid and also define the arch architectural shape of this building. Um, we were able to do clash detection with the clearance envelope. So you can see in the bottom there that you've got a pipe moving through the, the, the clearance zone and it's identifying that. And it's also, as I mentioned, was doing a preliminary assessment um, for a gateway concept costing of the building. So this code wasn't used to produce the final layout of, of the tripods, but it was used to create a preliminary understanding of them. Um, so you can see here, um, what we're also able to do was we're also able to change the form of the die grid in coordination with the architect um, to, to see what shapes we're looking for, um, the, the geometry of it, the width of it, um, and how that sat um, relative to the mall. So one thing I like to say is this is a very engineering led building. And by that, I mean, structural engineering came first and architecture followed, um, which was an interesting project to have because what we said had to go so there's a lot of elements of this building that we defined as structural engineers and then were integrated and adapted by the architect in order to, to form the shape and geometry of this building. Um, so very early on, we had to position this building. Um, so you can see this was our, our final die grid shape that, that, we, that we'd formed. And we need, needed to see how that fit relative to the mall. Um, so as you can see here, here's the GA of the building of the ground floor. On the left-hand side, you have the, the mall um, fit-out. So that's the that's part of the Dubai Hills Mall, and that's where you buy your ticket. There's a pre-show experience, and there's some offices and toilets in there. You walk into the platform, the load-unload station, where the roller coaster journey starts. Um, in the middle, you have the central core and also a um, private substation network there. Because of the power requirements of these magnetic motors, it doesn't require, it, it requires a very unusual electrical um, demand because you need all the power instantaneously for five seconds and then nothing for three minutes and then all the power again. So we had to have our own private network inside the building, um, which presented some challenges. On the top there, you can see the maintenance area. Um, so this is, this is a part of the track where the, the, the trains can go around outside of the public view and they can do regular maintenance and, and take, take the cars off the track. Um, and then the top building there is just some additional support MEP. We've, we've got generators, um, RMU and HP switch rooms up there. So we needed to define how does this building, so we had our diagram, we had our track, and we had to say, how does this fit relative to the mall? Um, so EMA was quite clear that they wanted people to be able to walk from the mall directly onto the roller coaster. So that involved dropping the entire building down three meters in un, underground um, because we were unable to ramp up for that load and load station. So essentially that blue zone there is, is cut um, that we had from the soil so that our coaster track at ground floor is exactly the ground floor of the mall. So what that meant was we had to retain the soil um, around it. So we eliminated one of the rings of the die grid. So on the, on the left-hand side, you can see the die grid going down the foundation, which is underground. And the right-hand side, the die grid sitting on top of that um, wall. Now, it was quite a high wall, but it didn't need to retain um, too much soil. And the reason that we want to keep it high is we didn't want to have partial die grids because then you've got eccentric connections where you don't have the, the two members connecting at a single node. 
So that, that wall was the full height of one of the, the hoop rings in the die grid and eliminated a full level of die grid connection. Now, because the wall was quite strong in, in its geometry, it didn't need to be that thick because it was only retaining about two meters of soil. Um, so as you can see here by the sketch, one of the early concepts was embedding a concrete column inside the wall. So we have a very thin wall that's cantilevering and horizontally spanning between these columns. And we have a thick, stronger column, which is running directly vertically down into a pile sitting below it. Um, inside the mall, um, not much structural engineering going on, but the, we had, that's where the, the guests walk in, they buy their tickets. Um, there's the queue, the pre-show experience, which has a motion platform. Um, and then they exit onto the, onto the, the um, station that enables you to load onto the roller coaster. Um, there's a feature staircase that we got to design in there, but other than that, it's just a, a simple fit out. Now, because we had our own private substation network from an MEP perspective, it was a balance of how we service this space from whether we service it from the supply that we'd be given by the, as a tenant on the mall or um, the supply on outside. So it was a challenge that we had to balance um, what we do from a cooling perspective and electrical and a data perspective between the two buildings. Um, some of the other features that were defined by the structure or, or the coaster itself. Um, so the roof tilt. So the roof tilt was, it's an aesthetic feature of the building, but the reason that it was done was purely to reduce cost and reduce the volume of space that needed required and the, and the amount of facade. So you can see the roof tilt lines up with the track's highest point and lowest point whilst respecting that clearance envelope. Um, so we originally had a flat roof that was lined up with the with the highest point of the track, but then we realized on the opposite side of the building, which is 40 meters away, the track's about five meters lower at that section. So we slanted the roof and pushed it down in order to reduce the, the volume of the building and the, the square meter requirement on the facade. One of the other features of the facade is the distribution of glass. So we had to do a 50-50 split between aluminum panels and glass panels um, from a uh, heat gain and, and energy point of view. Um, and you might look at the, the, the facade of the building and it looks like there's a random pattern of facade, but it's actually not a random pattern. It's a, it's, it was parametrically modeled to follow the track. So from the outside of the building, you can actually see the track following these glass patterns. And there was a code that was written in order to create this random looking pattern on the facade, but actually gives guests inside the best view out and guests from the outside the best view in of the, the roller coaster moving around. Um, so moving on to the design and modeling of this building. Um, so from a, a modeling point of view, um, these were the, the main five software that was being used. So early on in the preliminary size, and we're using Grasshopper 3D, which is the parametric model of the building. So that enabled us to define this die grid, play around with its position relative to the track, um, and then look at the preliminary positioning of these um, tripods, as well as a bunch of other things. We, the, the roof's parametrically modeled, the core's parametrically modeled, um, the, the, the foundation position um, and is parametrically modeled as well. Um, so from Grasshopper, we moved into Rhino. So Rhino was this geometry hub um, and it was the, the, the central point for us to connect um, everything together and hold that geometry. So from Rhino, we were able to go into Revit. We we're also able to manipulate the geometry in Grasshopper. We could also export it into Sophistic and we could also export it into ETAB. So Rhino was the central hub and held that geometry very, very accurately. Um, and, and accuracy was key on this project because normal construction tolerances weren't allowed. Um, we've got a track that's been manufactured in an air-conditioned facility in Slovakia, and we've got a die grid that's been welded in the Dubai heat and Dubai summer, and the tolerance allowed for these connections was 16 millimeters, and that's 55 meters in the air. So if you go to a normal contractor and you ask them to build a 50-meter tall building that is more is is off by 16 millimeters, they they would tell you that it's not possible, but um, we were able to do that. So by using this Rhino model, we're able to very accurately to the millimeter or even less than a millimeter um, hold this, of this geometry and make sure that we knew everything was positioned correctly. So Sophistic was being used for the dynamic analysis of the roller coaster. Um, so as you know, roller coasters move and as structural engineers, we don't really like things that move. Um, so 
it was was being that that was being used for the movement of the roller coaster and they run a lot of simulations for different permutations of weight distribution and speeds of the roller coaster so the roller coaster track or the roller coaster car itself is actually can accelerate or slow down depending on where people are sitting on it and how heavy they are so if you've got a bunch of light people on one side a bunch of heavy people on the other side or at the front of the back it changes and inside sophistic um the analysis was being run um, by Stengel Engineering in Germany, who was the, the dynamic structural engineer um, of Intamin, the, the ride vendor, and they were doing that dynamic analysis. Our primary structural model was being done in ETABs. So we had an entire ETABs build, uh, model for the entire building, um, which I'll, I'll go into depth a little bit later. Um, but that was obviously doing the, it was taking these dynamic forces, changing them into a static analysis, but also allowing it to be combined with the earthquake response spectrum of the building, um, the wind loading, the thermal loading, and then all the other loadings, clad in facade, roof live loads, um, which wasn't being done statistics. Statistics was only being used for the stress analysis and the fatigue analysis of the ride itself. And then obviously Revit um, was being used to produce the, the BIM model um, and, and the drawings for this structure. So, a little bit of a, a flow diagram of the data flow that we're using on this project. Um, so we had a track that was being given to us um, that was being held in Rhino. We're using Grasshopper to manipulate uh, parametrically this, this diagrid model. From the Rhino model, we're going back to the engineers um, in, in Germany who are running the Sophistic model. And also from the Rhino model, we'll build in our ETABS model. Now, that iteration um, arrow, that red one in the middle, is key because this roller coaster is producing thousands and thousands of forces, but every change you make in the building changes the stiffness of the building, which changes those forces that are coming out because the track is being analyzed with, with stiffness values as it goes around. Um, so during the peak design period of the project, every week um, we were transferring data between the ride designer in Germany um, and us in Dubai, because all the changes that we'll make in that involved everything else other than the track were, were affecting them. Um, I'll show later how we did that, but we were every week importing 178,000 loads into ETABs via Excel and, and some um, input coding. Um, we were using Dynamo to get the geometry from Rhino into Revit. Um, and then obviously the, the, the steel fabricator Cleveland Bridge was using Tecla in order to do the, the fabrication um, modeling of, of this building. So I have a little video here. This is not our coaster, um, but um, it's, a, it's a coaster that you can see in YouTube. And this is a sophistic model of a coaster. So you can see as that train moves around that track, um, we've got, you know, the, the, the stresses are, are, are getting bigger and again smaller as it's moving around and we have a lot of displacement of, of these supports. Um, so we were trying to get that dynamic analysis from the track into a static model that we'll run in in ETABS. Um, so what that meant was there was 261 live load cases for the track alone. So each one of those load cases represented a position on the track of the train under a certain permutation of weight and a certain permutation of speed. And all of those load cases were being applied at 120 interface locations. So the interface point is just the tripod to track connection. So there's 120 locations. Now, the key thing to note is when the train is near that tripod, that's when the force is the biggest. But this track acts as like a large moment frame because it's completely stiff and we've got a completely 100% like you know, moment connection. So as that track's moving around that building, if it's pushing over here, it's pulling over there. So your worst case push that you're designing for that tripod actually then needs to be complemented by 50 load cases later when it's also the worst case pull um, when the train might be up in the air or, or, or spinning over there or going slow or going faster. Um, so we needed to analyze every 187,000 forces that were being given to us. 
because we couldn't necessarily envelope because if we enveloped, it wasn't capturing the behavior of this building because if you envelope and you go, what's the maximum push and what's the maximum pull, then that doesn't really make sense because you're gonna have a building that might be um, canceling each other out by using an enveloped force as opposed to actually understanding how this building behaves. Um, so what we did, and I'm very glad to say it wasn't manually, was we wrote a script. And this is before, this was ETABS 2016 where we didn't have the user interface where you could use Excel directly. Um, so we had to write code um, that we could put into a list document that we could import into ETABS. And essentially what we had to do is we had to use the 261 live load cases and all the permutations between the earthquake response spectrum, um, the wind cardinal direction, so it's 36 wind cases, the temperature cases, the roof live load. So if you imagine you look at the AC and you've got your load cases, every single time it says L times that by 261, and that's how many load combinations we had in this building. So there was a huge amount of data management that was being used um, for analyzing this. And then the key thing to top it off, top it off was every week that 187,000 numbers changed. So we had to continuously um, update it. And by the end of it, there was a very, very clean code that was written that we could take the list document. We just hit run. It would automatically produce everything for ETABS. And we just copy paste it into ETABS over, over the entire thing. And it was done in five minutes. So every week, it was a five minute job in order to update these forces. So this is sort of how the data came to us. Um, and then just imagine thousands and thousands and thousands of that line. So. From there, we had to extract what we needed. Um, and how we were doing that is we're taking the, the global um, F, X, Y, Z, and moments. Um, we're taking the load case that's associated to, and then the corresponding locations, that interface point. From there, we were able to write the input into ETABS to put these forces into ETABS using the, the code that I wrote. And just to add more challenge was, the origins of the two models were different. So we had to use vector transformation because we've got a building sitting over here in Sophistic orientated like this, and then we've got a coaster sitting over here in ETABs orientated like that. So each one of those points um, and vectors and force directions had to be manipulated for between the two models. Um, a way that I'll change it in the future was to make sure that these origins were aligned. But early on, the reason that we aligned the reason that we aligned um, uh, the model, the ETAS model, is actually aligned on the origins of Dynamo, which then align with origins of Revit. So it enabled us very easily through Dynamo to export and import our design values automatically into Revit. So once we got those loads, we put them into ETAP. So you can see we had each of the load cases um, from the roller coaster. And then these were being applied as point loads onto um, the tripod. Now, this is where the two models differ quite significantly is because in the ETABS model, we didn't have the track. Um, and in the Sophistic model, obviously they did have the track because they're applying the loads. Um, there's two reasons that we didn't, um, we didn't put the track into ETABS. The first is it's very, very complicated with a lot of complex shapes, curved members and plates that would not have been correctly modeled into ETABS and wouldn't have given a false sense of how stiff or weak the building was. And the second thing was, is we were being given an interface load out of Sophistic that had these elements. So if we were to put the track in there without the load on there and put that interface load, then how that, change the building would have been wrong because that track would have added additional stiffness that didn't line up to the stiffness that existed because the track was in the sophistic model so because we were taking a load halfway through the structure adding the track without the load without the roller coaster directly on it would have actually changed how this building behaved and the building our displacements were larger in the etabs model than the sophistic model so by removing the track we made the building weaker which is more conservative and then we didn't have to worry about it. So there's a lot of decisions that went into why we didn't model the track. Um, there were some issues very late on when it came to the connection design because of uh, fatigue analysis. Um, but, but for the main um, analysis of the building, it, it wasn't a huge concern. And as I mentioned below, we're combining all these forces with the response spectrum, 
um, the wind, the thermal, dead, SDL, um, and, and facade loading of the building. So another code that was written was a visualization code used to look at these forces. Because when you open up a list document and you see 187,000 numbers, you don't actually know what that means or, or how it's affecting the building. Um, so we used Grasshopper to be able to input these forces into them and basically draw the forces as tubes in the vector orientation and draw the moments as, as um, cylinders or uh, uh, as rings. And that enabled us to see if we knew that we had a problem somewhere in the building as low case 25, we could go into the code and look at low case 25 and actually see how that force was being applied to the building. Because otherwise you're just looking at a huge list of numbers and that numbers doesn't make, make any sense. Um, so this here is a, a little video showing um, sliding through, and I'll zoom in in a bit. So you can see, so basically as we slide through, you can see the force grow and shrink on, on certain sections of the track as that coaster is moving around. Um, so that played very useful when we was doing the analysis and looking at, at, at different members and how they're behaving with respect to different um, with respect to different low cases. And you could actually see the, the coaster moving throughout the building with, the, with these forces visually. So looking at the structure as a whole, um, how did it behave? Um, so one of the key points um, was stiffness is a governing design factor. So I think this is one of the few buildings that are maybe the only building that the displacement under roller coaster load was the governing factor. So it wasn't stress from an ultimate limit state. It wasn't displacement from a from wind or earthquake. It was roller coaster differential movement of these tripods. So as a consequence, this building is exceptionally stiff and exceptionally strong from a utilization point of view because the movement of the tripod was the governing design factor. And because this diagrid is so stiff, we didn't and couldn't connect it to the core because it didn't make sense. So essentially the core is a, is a self-standing structure that's independently stable under its own self-weight and its own system. So that is, it, it's a traditional shear wall. So there's a stair core and there's an elevator inside the core. And then the roof was just a pin pin roof sitting around and not acting as a diaphragm. So essentially as this as the, the building moves, there's a little bit of force transfer, but it, it's less than 5%. This diagrid is the one that's taking all of that force. Um, as I said before, the, 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 the tripod and the diagrid was fully welded. So it's a completely fixed system. And then the, there was a concrete raft with a pile foundation, which I'll go into a bit later. So this diagrid was, was the governing factor. As I show here in this diagram is this was the this was the design in this was the criteria it wasn't it wasn't utilization it was how much does this tripod move with respect to this tripod because if that moves more than a certain amount what that does is it puts additional friction onto the wheels um, which can wear the wheels out it can slow the roller coaster down it can create bumps that are uncomfortable for guests and it, and and it can actually in a very 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 worst case scenario like like act as a break. Um, so there was very, very strict tolerance of how this roller coaster moves. And this is just a bit of advice that if you ever work on a project that has a ride, you need to know what your foundation stiffness requirement is. And that's that's the governing factor. So if you put in a if you put in a small ride on a slab inside a mall for an entertainment center, one of the key questions that you need to be asking the designer is what is your stiffness values required for my foundation? Because if that ride moves too much, then the then it doesn't fit with inside their design criteria and it's not allowed. So that that that's the key governing force. So as I said, this diagrid didn't move that much. Under the worst case SLS wind load, the top of it moves less than 10 millimeters. So it's not it, it, it's not going anywhere. So the displacement is almost a, um, I think H over 2,500, which is a lot stiffer than our, our normal buildings and how much they normally move. Um, so looking at the foundation, we've got an empty cylinder um, with not so much in the middle. So early on, 
we were just going to put piles under the die grid and piles underneath the core. And then the center was going to sit as a slab on grade um, with, a, with a movement joint around the outside to allow that to move. Um, and we started looking in that and discovered that that's actually not possible because there is four locations in the building where the track exits from the die grid and then goes onto this slab in the middle to then go to the, the station. And if we made a slab on grade, we couldn't guarantee that the vertical displacement of this slab under the roller coaster loading and the settlement would be within inside the tolerance that we needed for the track. And what would happen was that piece of track that extends from the from the die grid onto the onto the floor will then twist and and not meet the stiffness requirement. So as I said, that happens in four locations. So we had then we realized that we had to have a raft under this area. So the die grid from the core is 17 meters away. So it's a, it's a 17 meter circle um, on each side, and and that had to be connected, and we couldn't have them moving differentially between each other. So we started to look at two solutions. Um, the first solution um, was a piled raft, um, which is what the Dubai Opera House uses, it's what Burj Khalifa uses, and what Kingdom Tower uses, where essentially we're using the raft strength of this slab and only putting the piles under discrete locations. Um, we proceeded with this design um, and we did the full sensitivity analysis to understand what happens if the, the, the raft stiffness was 50% lower or 50% higher. Um, but we had some, um, what's the right word, discussions with municipality regarding the system and they, they, they believe that it was not the right system for this building um, and were concerned with that displacement differences. Um, so we had to make a tough decision in the project um, with the client was whether we were going to push it and, and try and, and reanalyze uh, and keep going down this power up solution or do we make the raft thinner, add more piles and then go a fully suspended raft solution and ignore the ground pressure underneath it. Um, and due to the project timelines, um, that was the decision that was made by the project manager and the client at the time. So the final raft solution is a suspended raft um, on piles where the entire thing is sitting on these piles. Um, so we have much larger, deeper, thicker piles around the um, die grid and the central core. And then in, in the center spread around, we have thinner piles that are just carrying this um, raft, which is 400 millimeters thick um, between the core and, and the outside. Um, a challenge that happened when we designed it was we realized when we designed in isolation, we forgot about the mall and the mall has piles as well underneath it. And that two and a half pile diameter failure was occurring near the coaster station because our piles were actually right next to the mall's piles. And we didn't realize until after we'd were very progressed in the in the, the foundation design. So as we can see our safe model there of the raft is we actually have quite large displacement at the section of the raft that's attached to the mall because that's actually cantilevered out because we couldn't put piles on that section because the mall piles that were already in the ground um, were, were sitting next to there. Um, one of the other areas which we don't really face was we had a very, very, very tall, thin wall because this core was only carrying itself and had nothing to do with the lateral stability of, of the building, the walls only needed to be 250 millimeters thick for a 50 meter high wall. And, and what that meant was there was quite large reinforcement congestions around openings and in particular, um, in, as you can see here, the embedded plates for the steel beams um, to connect into the wall. And that was quite a challenge um, because the wall was so thin. Um, so that's something that looking back at the project, I would have liked to see maybe we could have done a steel core with, with precast panels is another option, but because there was very, very little lateral force going into this wall, it didn't require that, that thick of a, of a concrete system, which presented a lot of challenges as well with embedded conduits. The contractor was wanting to run a lot, a lot of electrical wires through the wall, but you put a 25 millimeter um, PVC pipe in a 250 millimeter thick wall, you've eliminated a big portion of that concrete and especially when they put four of them next to each other. So that was something in the construction that we picked up early that we couldn't follow what we usually do in towers, which is embedded electrical wires inside the concrete wall 
purely because you, we just couldn't guarantee that there was enough aggregate distribution around the steel reinforcement and the conduits and make sure that we could compact it. So that, that, was, that was something that we picked up during construction. Um, looking at the structures of the supporting areas around it. So in the top left um, is the, that's the substation, which is inside the building um, around, around the center of the core. So inside there, we have the transformers, um, we have the ride electrical room, um, and that's just a simple steel frame, um, uh, brace frame with a composite slab. As I said, the roof um, was a pin-pin system, and a quite large span. So the longest beams there are 18 meters, I believe. So we pre-cambered the roof um, because of, of the span distance. And then one of the, the challenges was we also had to put a BMU on the roof. So we've got a very lightweight, long span roof that we're putting a crane on the top of. Um, so that was the governing factor for the design of the roof. And then also we have the maintenance facility um, on the side. So the maintenance facility was just attached into the dry grid and it's using the nodes um, for the support of one side. And that was a bit challenging geometrically because we've got a circular building that we're putting a square um, a rectangle um, block onto, onto the side of it. Um, but the die grid strength and stiffness basically acts, that hoop ring sort of acts as a, as a diaphragm to support this, support this roof. Um, inside the core, um, we, we use, uh, as suggested by the contractor, they want to use precast stairs. Um, so that enabled them to use a slip form and jump that core really, really, really fast to get the full height out of it. And then we had an in situ corbel that was connected in with um, reinforcement couplers and pull-out bars that were poured into the wall and they chipped them and, and bent them out. So you can see in that photo, we've got the, the pull-out bars sitting there with these corbels that were poured after the construction of this wall. So they just had a smooth wall and they had an in, embedded steel plate that had these couplers that they could connect this corbel into it. And then they had the entire um, 50 meters of stairs and they just dropped them straight through the roof um, and, and installed them quite quickly. So some little things, um, nuggets of knowledge on this design. Um, so the first one is impact loading. So this is something that when you're designing something that's moving, you need to account for impact loading, which we don't really consider that often um, during the construction of our buildings. So we, did, we had two conflicting um, information on impact loading. So the ASCE, which we were designing the building towards, was saying that it was either 20% or 50%, and the 50% was the um, reciprocating machines and power driven devices. Now, what's a roller coaster? We don't really know what that is. And with respect to what they were trying to achieve in that, because if you read that, that's more about uh, manufacturing machinery and, and, and big moving devices that are attached to our structures. So then you've got the BSEN, um, which is, that is the code that they design roller coasters to, which is the fairground amusement park, parks and structure, machinery and structures. Um, and this one here, like all BSE in codes is sort of saying, well, we suggest this, but you as the designer really need to know what you're doing and, and choose the appropriate number. So that was saying not less than 1.2. Um, now, we were debating what is this impact factor that we're, that, that, that we're needing to use for the building. Um, but then as we started to look at the building, because the stress utilizations were so low in this building, because the stiffness was so high and the members were so high, we ended up using the ASCE 1.5 to make sure that there's no issues from authority or third party review. Um, and it didn't it overall didn't really affect the design of the building because there was so much reserve stress capacity inside the building. Um, but if it was designed, if, it, if it's a different design, it's just something to consider what is the appropriate factor to account for transferring dynamic force into a static analysis. Facade vibration is another key concern. Um, and the facade solution has been detailed with vibration isolation pads um, to reduce the amount of, of movement because we're connecting this roller coaster directly into the wall of, of this building. The building's moving as this roller coaster moves around. So the facade has been isolated. You can see that green line there. Early, early on in the project, we're looking at the possibility of using ETFE. Um, rather than glass. So ETFE is that, that plastic bubble that's, that you sometimes see in stadiums and greenhouses. 
Um, but that was scrapped because of aesthetic reasons and durability because ETFE, um, even with a cigarette butt, you can sort of burn through them quite easily. So they're not, they're not the strongest of materials. Um, but that was something that, that was included in the design was isolating this glass from the die grid. Um, another thing that was really, really difficult to decide on was what is this building? Because in, it, this building is, is a G building. There's no, there's, it's an open atrium. It's a G plus roof for most of the die grid. So when the code came to fire protection, a building that's own a structure that's only supporting the roof only needs a one hour fire rate in from an intermittent painting point of view. But this is definitely not a regular building. And it's important to understand if a code says something, you need to understand what the, what is the intent of this code. And this intent of the code was not a 50 meter tall building. Um, so from a pricing point of view, we worked with the cost consultants and we originally put a two hour fire rate in when we did the steel tender. Um, but what we ended up doing was we did a full CFD smoke and fire analysis of the building and then took that um, to civil defense and were able to decrease the, the die grid fire rating from two hours to one hour, which saved a lot of paint. And as we learned last year in the CBD door and paint, it's not linear, it's exponential. So there's a lot of paint that was saved from two hours to one hour reduction of the um, die grid members. And then this is also... Um, I mentioned before, but the track tolerance. So that we had a plus or minus 16 millimeter tolerance. And that was because there was oversized holes with oversized nuts for these connections between the die grid tripod and, and the track. So to get that tolerance and that accuracy, um, Cleveland Bridge did a fantastic job with the assembly. Um, and I believe out of the full 120 interface points, there's only two points that they had to cut and reweld on site because they weren't um, aligned correctly. Um, there's a lot of challenges for the track installer um, and most of the install actually happened at nighttime because this building grows throughout the day and, and you, you could have a track piece that's off by a hundred millimeters in the morning and by, by the afternoon it might be in the right position. So they actually had to sort of monitor and put these pieces in um, usually during cooler periods so they could line up the steel correctly. The other challenge with installing the roller coaster is a roller coaster has a female male plug in the rails. Um, so you can't just put pieces in wherever you want. You have to put the, put the coaster in in order. Um, and that was early on a challenge of understanding where to start and how to put it in there. It's that last piece you essentially have to bend and, and, and snap it into position. Um, but because this roller coaster within three track segments could move from level two of the die grid up to level six of the die grid um, and, and three track pieces might be three days of sequence in, Basically, the whole die grid was built prior to the track going in um, because we could align and make sure the die grid was, was, was shaped correctly and then the track could go in there because what they didn't want to do is they start putting the track in as the building's going up and then and the track was weighed in and the building was weighed in and then obviously if it's not aligned, aligned correctly as so they built the die grid and then, and then they installed the track. Another challenge that the contractor faced from a constructability point of view was there's no floors in this building. So it's really, there's no access. Um, so as you can see by this photo here, this absolute labyrinth of scaffolding. And I believe it's the first project that Alec did that they actually modeled in BIM 360, their scaffolding that they built on site because they needed to know exactly where they wanted scaffolding. So they needed to scaffold every interface point, at every sensor, at every break, um, and and also the MEP because on that on on the wall we have sprinklers and and we have speakers and and lighting as well. Um, so the, the scaffolding team did an incredible job in order to position the scaffolding, but they also respected the clearance envelope because once they built it, you had to do what's called a pull through. So a pull through is you move the roller coaster through the track very very slowly on winches, and you have this clearance envelope physically built, and and you have to prove that it's not going to hit anything. So they actually, as you can see there, they, they've got the scaffolding was open and it enabled the roller coaster, not under power, but under, uh, under being, being pulled, enabled the roller coaster to move through the scaffolding and they could still have access. So it was, it was an incredible thing what they did with that scaffolding. And it took about half an hour to get to the top because of those ladders. Um, Another thing was it, there's also basically a, a maintenance building attached to the side of it, which means we had to bring in a lot of industrial equipment um, and items into it. Now, because this building sits three meters below the ground, 
we had to think about how do we get equipment in and out of the building, especially these transformers. I think the transformer seven tons. Um, so we had to around the roller coaster had to do sort of a, a sweat path analysis of maneuvering this transformer in and out and that around all the columns into the maintenance facility. And then how can we lift it and get it out? Also in this maintenance area, you can see the coasters parked here. The coaster, um, each train weighs, or each car on the train weighs two and a half tons as well. So we had to have a sliding jib crane. Now, these were all cantilevered because you've got a straight wall and you've got a curved building on the other side. So we couldn't have a traditional boom crane that you'd have in a warehouse where you've got two rails on either side of it. So that was a, a challenge that we had is do we build a steel frame that can support that rail we have a regular crane which is a much cheaper crane but then we have to build the steel system and and look at the foundation there or do we beef up this wall to take this cantilever jib crane off off the wall so you've got the, the two and a half ton which is a sliding one that moves up and down and then you've also got this eight and a half ton which is able to lift the transformer out of the building <coughs> um Another aspect that we had to integrate into our design was internal access. So how do you get anywhere in this building? Um, because you can't get a 50 meter high cherry picker inside there. So we designed a rail system, um, which is hung from the roof that enables an abseiling team to move around. And under discussion with abseiling teams, essentially they can get two ropes onto two of these poles. And depending on the tension in each of these rope, they can actually sort of laterally move themselves inside this building. So with those four pipes, one around the core and three on the perimeter, they can actually get to any point within inside this building um, to do maintenance and inspections. And with a roller coaster track, um, every six months, you have to do a torque test on the bolts to ensure that the bolts aren't loosening due to the vibration. So every six months, someone has to be there at every single bolt. So um, 816 interface bolts that have to be checked every six months. So quickly going through some of the construction. Um, so obviously it started with underground services that were that were put um, into into the soil and once the piling was done. Um, there is a waterproofing layer um, because of the launch system. Um, we actually had to dig a pit four and a half meters below the raft even further. So the bottom of this building is sitting sort of, I think about seven meters below the actual ground level. And the reason for that is this vertical launch, if the roller coaster fails, it rolls backwards. And there had to be a deep enough pit with gravity to stop that roller coaster from going backwards into the station um, and, and hitting the next train that's moved in there to wait. So the lowest point of this building um, was sitting just above the water table. Um, so there was what it, we, there, there's a quite um, comprehensive waterproofing system for that element where it's sitting quite low. Um, the raft was done in two pores. Um, this is just an example of, of, so three pores, sorry, an example of what was being done for that. And you can see here that we had to put in the roller coaster embedded bolts into the raft as it's being poured. So these, these roller coaster bolts, um, uh about 650 mil, mil long um so in some areas where the raft was too thin we sort of plinth up in order to get that embedment and that plinth's wide enough that for the for the design of the pull out that that bolt was fine and in the thick areas of the raft they can sit flat flush um here's a photo of one of the diagrib joints to show you the size I and mean, that's that's my hand there so each one of these pipes um is nearly half a meter in diameter um and it was a full penetration um, weld for these six members coming into them with internal stiffness, which was governed by the fatigue analysis of these joints. So the, I mean, the quality of the welding that Cleveland did was amazing and it was really, really impressive what they did, but the, it, these joints were absolutely massive. And this was sort of the first time I went to the steel factory and saw this joint and you, you, you've spent two years looking at a model couple centimeters on your screen and you sit there and you go that's one of these nodes and there's 20 of these per level and there's seven levels so it really put in perspective this is the ingredients for the die grid so that's the building sitting there um the and and they were obviously using a laser cut in order to to get these profiles in um 
here's a photo of the the core cool jump form. So as I said, they just they shot up with the elevator and the the stair core, um, and that that was completely freestanding. And then they followed later with the the, the steel framing for the rest of that that MEP floor. Um, the each ring of the diagrid has 20 nodes, and these are fabricated as individual um, as, as as pieces. So there's 10 pieces per level. So these these pieces have been delivered to site, and they're about six and a half meters wide and about 21 meters long. So they're quite large pieces, um, and they had to have quite a, a big crane that, to get that 50 meter reach in order to put these pieces into position. As I said, that it's a full um, penetration weld for this diagrid. So they have these temporary connection cleats and that enables them to bolt the whole level together. And once that whole level was bolted together and then aligned, they went along and did the tack welding and then they went and did that full penetration weld. And you can see here with the colors, so the gray is the intermittent paint, the red is the primer, and then you've got the raw material. So they essentially had these, these, these stripped back joints with enough distance that the heat propagation from the welding didn't activate the intermittent paint. And then when it came later, they, they, they um, grinded it flat and then and applied this paint in for the joints. Um, as I said, the, the track was manufactured in Slovakia, um, just near Bratislava. Um, so this arrived, um, each track segment has to be shorter than 12 meters because it fits into the into a shipping container. So the track segmented into a whole whole bunch of pieces, um, and then and these pieces had to be put together and assembled. Um, and then just here's a photo of one of those diagrid connections in these bird cage. Um, uh, scaffolding elements that had to so the the coordination between the main contractor and the steel contractor to make sure that they could lift these pieces down into the building and slot them in um, and became even more complicated when they're putting these um, um, track pieces in so you've got these 12 meter long track pieces that they're trying to work into the building through the scaffolding down um, here's a photo from the station looking back into the the maintenance facility so this is a switch track so like what a train is so that's able to move left and right um, and that that enables you to send a, a, a poster car into the maintenance area um, or, or for the normal pathway and then the facade um, was a unitized the system of 50% glass 50% um, aluminium panel which they built a monorail along the top so that they, the facade contractor didn't have to rely on the lifting capacity. The lifting was purely for the die grid and for the, the, the track from the cranes. And they had their own monorail system around the perimeter in order to install the facade. Um, so as you can see here, there's, there's two, two tower cranes on site. One was doing half the mall and half the roller coaster. And the yellow one was the big heavy one that had the ability to lift these huge big um, die grid pieces into position. So the whole site was seen lower, they built it, and then they backfilled the, the soil in order to get that ground level. Um, you can see the core jumping up um, with the, the big die grid pieces you can see down the bottom that will be put into position. And as that die grid goes up, um, and, and the core as well. And here's a photo from the inside during construction, um, looking at so each, each die grid level had, had a scaffold level that you could walk around. Um, and then obviously the, the MEP team was from the sprinklers. Um, just this photo is just something to look out for as a structural engineer. Um, we always make assumptions for the ceiling services, like in this room, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. Now, we made assumptions for the ceiling services for the back house, but the MEP team bought everything in in one location and one strip. So we had a ceiling that had absolutely no services and then a two meter wide area that had fire pipes that were 200 millimeters in diameter fully pressurized to go up the whole building so it's just something to consider that when you do your design and you make an assumption for your ceiling services look at the MEP drawings look at the MEP model and talk to the MEP engineers to say is that assumption correct and is the loading correct because there might be a case where you could save some money by reducing the ceiling services in areas that don't have the distribution when you have the distribution up in up in the strength there so it's just something to consider um, and and, and liaise with your, your other teammates. Um, I got to ride the roller coaster the first ride on opening day. <laughs> so it was a soft launch and the client called me and said, we're opening in half an hour, get down here. So I, I rocked up and I sat in the chair and I asked the client if they're gonna go on the coaster with me. And they said, no, no, you go first. <laughs> and then we'll go the second ride. 
<laughs> so I, I went off myself and the and the, 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 the ride vendor, the two of us in on the train by ourselves as we left the station. There's a whole bunch of people from email giving us a wave as, as, as we go off. So I think it, what makes this project special for me is, is I can actually see people using it and enjoying it. A lot of the time you build something and, you know, if you make a hotel in another country and you never stay in that hotel or you don't actually get to experience it. So it's whenever I'm at the mall, I, I go there and actually like to see people actually using it and, and, and it's quite exciting. Um, just really quickly, sorry, I know I've run a little bit over, but just what makes a very good engineer is someone that doesn't understand just your field, but understands everyone else. And I think it's really important when you do designs, not just think about, you know, I'm a structural engineer, I'm looking at the structure, but also think about what's the MEP team doing and how can I help them make their job easier and how can they help me make my job easier. So just quickly to run through some of the systems and, and the innovations that the rest of the Cundall team did during the design. Um, so I've talked about this MEP call and this is sort of what, what the model looks like, but we've got this very, very large volume that we cool from the middle. So we've got um, seven levels, you've got a fresh air handling unit on top, and then you've got double stacked air handling units in each of these levels. And what that's doing is pushing the air out. What we've also done is we've, the, the intake is actually located right next to this tower where the launch system is. So actually that, that's the heat producing element. We have a very, very low thermal load in this building because you have a maximum of 24 people in the building at any one time. So you don't have the, the wattage of heat being produced by the, by the people, but you have these motors of this magnetic launch system. So the intake is right, located right next to the launch to suck the hot air in, cool it, and, and blow the air out. What we also did was we did stacked cooling and a staggered temperature, sorry, on, on, on height. So the actual top of the building is actually at 30 degrees Celsius, where the bottom of the building is at 22 or 23 degrees Celsius. Because at the top, you're up there for less than seven seconds, and you're also moving at 80 kilometers an hour. So if someone gets up there and goes, oh, it's a little bit hot up there, then they won't really enjoy the roller coaster ride. So that was something that we did in order to reduce the amount of operational energy that the building's using because we the building gets hotter as we go up, so we don't have to use as much energy to cool to cool the air. Um, as I said, it, there's a there's a special transformer um, which is very very it's a custom transformer just for the roller coaster which is located inside the building. So this is a photo from the BIM model, just the services, no structure. You can sort of see the building as it is, but it's just the services. Um, so obviously there's a lot of requirements, as I said, about how do we get the transform in and out, um, talking about trenching, cable distribution, um, and, and understanding what we need to do to help this structure, um, you know, support the, the services of this building. Um, from a fire point of view, um, one of the challenges was the escape strategy, because you have a building that you've got a track wrapping around and manipulating so that it's not there's not clear escape strategy so we had to work and there's actually three structural bridges that cross the track inside the building so that during a fire anyone is able to escape also we had to work with the ride vendor and our fire team and the supplier of the um uh, the fire system the bms because it had the fire alarm had to be linked to the roller coaster. So basically, if the fire alarm goes off, then it tells the roller coaster the fire alarm's going off, and it won't let the fire alarm, it won't let the ro roller coaster launch. If it's halfway through a launch, you know, it will abort the launch, or it will return it back to the station. So we had to integrate the fire system um, with the roller coaster's control system, and put them together. Also, because it's a very large atrium, as you saw the CFD, we have a lot of smoke that's being produced during a fire in, the, in this atrium. So in the structure down the bottom in this retaining wall, we have these large openings that the vents are open to suck air in. And then there's, there's fans at the top that pull air out of it. So during a fire, all the smoke will be pulled up. One final thing was there is a door access control system um, on these fire escapes. So if one of these fire escape doors is open, the whole ride shuts down and it won't allow you to be in there. And the reason for that was um, any maintenance staff that's walking around through the building, I mean, can, could die if they're standing next to a track and a roller coaster comes through. So no one can be inside the building when the ride's operational and all the doors have magnetic locking systems so that when the ride has gone, you cannot open that door unless it's a fire. And if you do that, then it tells the ride to stop. So there's the integration of this. Um, there's a lot of lighting um, and lighting design gone into it. And then one of the, one of the things that we use parametric placement in order to put these lights and do the modeling of these lights on the track. So you've got this track that's whipping around and, and 
in order to model the end of Revit, um, I helped our lighting team write a grasshopper code that would position these LED lights with respect to the track where it was that they could actually model it correctly, as opposed to someone going around and manually in Revit putting these lights on the track. Um, so again, it's about you know collaborating and understanding if if a team has a challenge that they need to do and you've got the skill set to do it, then it then it's okay to jump across and, and help them do that in order to efficiently deliver everything. Um, and from a civil point of view, um, we cut the um, fire truck access around the mall. So all malls in UAE have to have fire truck access that goes around there. So we had to work with the mall fire or team um, and the landscaping team in order to create the landscape because we sort of had a site inside a site, but we've created that so that a fire truck has access from both sides. And then we had to do the paved service so that they could do that they could turn around on it. Also, another thing is because we were, because this building was now sitting below the ground level, um, all of the drainage was actually lower than the stormwater drainage collection points for um, for the mall. So we actually we have have a sump and a pump inside the raft so that we can get the water out because we're sitting lower than than the level of the building. Um, so that's everything from me. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed. And thank you very much, uh, Callum. That was a very, very interesting uh, talk. So um, uh, thanks all for showing up face-to-face. Uh, -face. So you're going to get the, the slight advantage now. You can ask Callum questions first before we, uh, before we move online. So anyone, um, anyone here in the room have any questions? Hey, Callum. Uh, my name is Paul. Um, my question is regarding the connections and how you designed them. You, you mentioned, as with any um, structure with dynamic forces, you would expect it to have uh, fatigue governing the connection designs. So how did you go about it? What software did you use in specific? And what was the fatigue loading criteria in specific? If you know that from the top of your head. Thank you. Um, the connections for the diagrid and the tripods um, were designed in ANSYS. Um, so there's an FE model done of that connection for fatigue. Um, I personally didn't do that design. It was done by Cleveland Bridge's design team. Um, but what we were able to do is we were able to give them the ETABS model that had the precise loading of each of these members. So it wasn't, it wasn't enveloped. Um, and from my understanding that one of the the factors that assisted with the fatigue analysis was because the stress was less than a certain point. We weren't exceeding a certain percentage of that yielding that yield stress, which helped with the fatigue analysis. But then we also had to make assumptions on how many load how many loads it would receive. So if the ride's running once every five minutes for six hours a day, seven days a week for 35 years, 40 years, 50 years, so how many cyclic loading that that they'll do. Um, but there was a FE model done of the diagram node, of the tripod node, um, and consequently, because some of the fatigue enforcers there was inside the node, there was individual plates put in there to help the stress distribution around those welds, which is what you're worried about in the fatigue analysis is the weld. The actual member itself is because it's a hot rolled conglomerate material, you're not having that fatigue propagation from that joint. So it's the joint that was the main concern. Uh, anyone else uh, have any questions? Um, my question is uh, regarding the foundation options, uh, the pile draft uh, option that was declined by the municipality. Uh, um, did you use um, uh, safe uh, CSI to analyze uh, the contribution of the raft? regarding piles, um, it was the safe model, modeling. Yeah. I mean. um, so we used, we used safe, CSI safe. Um, mm -hmm. We had two soil, the microphone so people like in here. Uh, yes, so we used CSI safe to, to analyze that raft. Um, we had two soil investigations that were done. So we knew what the, the bearing pressure of the soil was and what that pile stiffness was um, and the, the displacements of the piles under certain loading. 
Um, so what we did in, in SAFE was we applied the soil pressure underneath the raft as well as the spring stiffnesses of each of the, of the piles and then also then did a sensitivity analysis. So we did, we increased the pile stiffness, we decreased the pile stiffness, increased the, the, the foundation stiffness, decreased it. And we went through a lot of iterations of that with Socotec, who are the, the third party municipality approval, uh, third party reviewer of it. Um, it's something that we could have pushed harder, um, but what we were able to do is we were able to, by going to a fully piled system, we could reduce the thickness of that raft because we didn't have the same sort of stress distribution going through it um, and balance that with, with the piles. So it's something that because of the constraints of the project, that, that that's the line that we went down um, and that's the solution of the foundation that we did. Um, but it is something that SAFE does um, and is it, there's another, there's another software that I, it's on the tip of my tongue that also is better used for sensitivity analysis of, of soil. And you can actually model the soil in 3D. Um, yes, yeah, like this. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, but it's also a combination of how it sat with an authority point of view, because this was not an individual project. It was an extension of the mall. So it was sort of being treated as a mall. Same design criteria. Yeah. So it was, it, we, we, because we're following the, the, the design of the mall and, and, and the architecture record on the mall and Arcadis with the LDC for the mall and design like that, we were, our submissions were not individual submissions. They were basically extensions to an existing building. And then there was a combination of, of sort of, it's a mall, we know this works and because it's not completely flat we do have a lot of angular surfaces so you're not you can't guarantee that that you know by by um going through and, and building that soil layer by layer and doing the compression that 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 will sit perfectly so there's a lot of concern um raised by that and a lot of discussions that we had and basically at the end of the day the discussion with the project manager the cost consultant and the client was we can either go through the route of sort of doing a different application, not as part of the mall and, and showing the analysis, or we can make Callum work until 2 a.m. and redesign the raft in three days and, and, and get it submitted under a solution that was the exact same as, as the mall. So yeah, both systems worked um, and by increasing the number of piles, we could decrease the amount of concrete in the raft. So there was a, there was a balance to it. Thanks, Kalam, for the presentation. It was very interesting. So I have three questions, actually. First one is, uh, any concerns because of vibration on the structure itself and also on nearby slabs, like the station slabs or anything? Second one, anything because of the temperature load, especially for the tracks itself, because you're fixing it at mostly all the points. So how did you deal with the temperature concerns there? And third one is, any particular challenges in construction because you're using a diagrid system, because there are some constraints and how you go about a diagrid system. So was there any particular challenges in terms of how you construct the whole thing? Thanks. So only three questions from Sajid. So the first question about vibration. So yeah, vibration was always a consideration of concern from day one. Um, no one had really done this and put a full speed. There had been smaller roller coasters that were in malls and indoor theme parks, but no one had put a full uh, magnetic launch coaster into a building. So vibration was a key concern. Um, what we were more worried about um, was basically structural vibration acoustics going into the mall as well. So if you're standing inside the mall and you can and you can hear the roller coaster, you can feel the ro roller coaster. So that was mitigated by separating the foundation system as much as possible in between and there's some layers as well as that glass wall in between the two structures like an acoustic um, isolated and insulated wall so if you stand inside you, you can't really hear the outside from a structural point of view um it was a, it, it was a concern um from the connections into the concrete so the the embedded bolts um the and how, how this diagrid sits on top of the on top of the foundation um so that we did um quite a bit of analysis with respect to how the how these connections take these forces and understanding that 
the roller coaster itself where it's connected to the diagrid is quite high up the building. Um, it, it's sort of sitting more than 12 or 13 meters with the last sort of tripod before it gets to that ground as well. So because of the diagrid system, the fact that it's all connected together, that, that dissipation of, of energy also reduces the vibration at individual elements because it's not just one item, it, it, it's spread in, inside of it as well. Um, there was a lot of discussion um, with regards to fatigue, with regards to, to, to cracking in the concrete. Um, and a lot of the discussion was, was had with the ride dynamic specialist in Germany because this is what they do for a living, this is what they do for a job. So a lot of these connections and the bolts and the embedment depths and, and the, 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 the pre-talking of these bolts were based off, off their design advice from their experience of how you connect roller coasters to concrete foundations. That's the first one. The second one was diagrid challenges. Yes, or was that the third? That was the third one. Temperature was the second one. <laughs> so, so temperature was, was a key concern. Um, the building is designed, every steel element is designed steel and concrete for plus or minus 30, which is quite high considering it is a conditioned space. But we knew that this track would be installed and begin preliminary testing when it was still exposed to the elements. Um, the way that the facade's designed is there is reduced thermal bridging because we don't have, we're not infilling the steel panel. We're, we're having a completely enclosed facade system that's sitting on the outside of this diagrid. So it's quite well thermally insulated, this building. Um, but the Sophistic model and the ETABS model were both run with all these combinations with this um, temperature loading included in there. And then essentially the building goes up and out as, as it gets hotter and it goes down and in as, as it gets cooler. But we did, we, we did that check. Um, one of the other issues with the temperature loading was the shrinkage and, and expansion of the raft as well. So that was actually putting like lateral forces into the top of the piles and, and, and put in some moments in the top of the pile because this raft, because it is completely monolithic, there's no sort of expansion joints sitting inside it. So we have 1,600 square meters of, of concrete that's sort of sitting there. So that, that's one thing that we'll do in the pile design. We had to do that consideration for the temperature loading inside the raft itself. Um, with regards to the diagrid, um, not the diagrid itself, but the issue is that this building has no floors, no diaphragm. So from a constructability point of view, it's quite a challenge on, on how these elements sit um, with respect to each other. So um, I know Cleveland Bridge, when they did the analysis, and especially these, so these, these um, bolted temporary holds for the diagrid, that was designed, so there's, there's a plate on all four sides, that was designed to take the full force and weight of that overturning into the eccentricity of that and wind blowing on it. So that, that, that could hold in position with those two connections temporarily until they get the full ring in. And once you get the full ring in, then you've got that hoop stress that's locking, locking into it horizontally. Um, they were also then using the core in order to use, um, tensioning wires to move that once locked in, move this hoop from side to side. So they, they were able to use the core and, and either pull it up or pull it down, pull it left, pull it right in order to get that alignment. Um, and then the surveyors did an incredible job basically making sure that each of these elements was, was within that 16 millimeters of tolerance. Um, so a diagrid is more complicated from a welding point of view, but from a, from a material point of view, there's only 10 pieces per level, as opposed to if this was was a, like a bolted brace frame, then you've got, you know, m m maybe 80 to 100 individual elements on each ring that you're trying to assemble. And you've got a lot more play where they could jig this in the factory. These are very, very, very large pieces. And the advantage of Cleveland Bridge was there in Jebel Ali. So it was a very short trips. They had, they got oversized permits for the transportation. They moved at nighttime under police escort and you get these very, very large pieces that were millimeter accurate in, in the, in the fabrication yard and then bring it to site and then, and bolt it together. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, after construction, was there any, sorry, my name is Karim. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. After construction was finished, was there any load testings on the structure or due to this dynamic 
nature of the of the thing was there any low testing in field testing anything for the for the final structure thanks yeah yeah i was the i was the low test <laughs> um in the sense of actually verifying what the force in our model was to what it was actually that wasn't done um I mean, I've worked on a bridge project in the past where we embedded strain gauges into the system so that we could see if the strain in the model matched the, the strain in the bridge afterwards. That wasn't done. Um, but what was done was the on the train itself, um, there is a lot of testing with, with water dummies on the ride before it's verified by TUV, which is the German certifying company, TUV Sud. Um, and when they do that, they put a lot of sensors on the on the train itself to measure the G-force, um, the inertia, and the displacement of the train as it moves around. So we didn't necessarily do it on the steel structure itself, but the there's about a to open a roller coaster. There's a month of testing where they're running over and over and over that train um, to make sure that that each of the sensors and the speed and the you know the, the acceleration and the g's because that that all has to meet international codes for the safety of the occupants as well so there's a lot of that at testing was done there wasn't necessarily structural testing that was done um but i know that what they do is there's periods especially i mean bolt tightness is one of the biggest concerns for a roller coaster so um all the bolts on the track are, are pre-tensioned so they pull the bolt they tighten it and they release it so that it's got a preloaded tension force inside it um but basically by by putting these dummies on there in different orientations and different weight distributions they were able to test the ride as well as there's a there's a, a bolt loosening test where they ride they run the train non-stop for like 24 hours or 48 hours just continuously on the track and then they go back and they measure the torque in these bolts to make sure that they're, they're still tight any more questions good Uh, hi, a very good presentation. Uh, I would like to know any rare event was considered like uh, accidental derailment we use for rails. So any uh, structure is checked for that kind of event. Uh, that's my Sort of, <laughs> to answer your question. So um, that was a discussion um, because particularly with bridges and with trains, derailment um, impact and, and, and accidents is, is a design consideration. Um, we had that discussion um, with, with the ride supplier and what, what the standard procedure is for this, um, for a roller coaster. Now, the way that the bogey, which is what a roller coaster calls its wheels, how it works is essentially there's three wheels on, on each side of the rail on both sides. So that, that's locked in there. So, the, the ride supplier was saying that, that the train has to physically break in half for it to derail. It's not like a, a not like a, a, a train, a, a regular train where it's sort of just gravity sitting on top of a rail and it's a little bit easier to derail. This the actual metal has to split for the to, train to come off. Now, in saying that, because of the strength of this die grid, um, we looked into just removing a member. So if this member just completely was done, uh, gone, and the strength and stability of this building is is not an issue. So it, by physically getting rid of a member, the, the building is structurally, from an SLS and ULS point of view, safe. It's not from a stiffness point of view for that track, but for that to happen, the whole roller coaster has to be, go through a huge accident. So I think um, remembering the email when we're asking the, the ride supplier and the ride designer in Germany, they're basically saying if it derails, you've got bigger issues because you've got a train going through the glass rather than the structure, which won't have an issue. Uh, any more questions? Uh, okay, we'll uh, we'll go to this. Uh, just a couple of comments online. Um, Andrew Ng just made the comment. Uh, Callum, thanking you very very much for uh, excellent um, presentation, full of uh, high end uh, structural engineering. So thank you for that. Um, Reggie Kumar has a question. Uh, what was the scheduled time frame and the completion of the design phase as you executed so many options? You had time to 
do investigation. Uh, thanks, Rajkumar. Um, so we started the project um, at a pre-concept stage in August 2018, and we finished the detailed design in April 2019. Um, so the concept period, the concept period was was done in um, September, October 18. The schematic design was um, sort of November through to January, and the detailed design was was February, March. Um, so all in all, about six months from start of the design to the, the completion of the design. There's a couple of changes that happened later um, that had to be integrated and, and, and redesigned. But all in all, from the first um, first meeting um, was to the end was, yeah, from August to April. And then the construction um, was from from middle of 2019, and then open opening day was on um, February 2021 or 2022. Sorry, was opening day, but there was there was a period where the where there was the, the construction had finished, and then it was just a lot of testing being done. There's a lot more testing and commissioning in a roller coaster than there is in a regular building. Uh, no, Phil, it's just uh, just thanking you again for uh, for an excellent presentation. Um, I believe that's um, the end of the of the questioning. So again, on behalf of uh, the regional group of uh, Institute of Structural Engineers based in Dubai, who Callum is also a committee member, uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Callum, for taking the time um, to 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 uh, present. It was a truly truly uh, very very interesting. Um, project. And um, for anyone, um, if you want to share uh, this presentation with anyone, you'll, you'll see it on our YouTube uh, page uh, in the next in the next two or three days. Um, okay, so I think we'll bring the session to a close. And for everyone that's joined us here, please feel free to have some um, tea and coffee and some some pastries before you go. Um, and we actually might just um, all, if we can come up to the stage and we'll, uh, we'll get a, a group uh, photo. Thank you. Can you, can you put your first slide in the background? Sure. I'm just going to end the Zoom. Yeah? Okay.